I extend a warm welcome to you and greet you on account of the World Radiology Day, or it's also known as the International Day of Radiology. It's uh, commemorated to celebrate the discovery of X-rays. It was done by a German mechanical engineer way back in 1895 who discovered the electromagnetic rays in this spectrum, which he did not know what to name as. And he just said that these are X-rays or something that we don't see. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics, that was the first Nobel Prize for Physics in 1901. And of course, radiology has traveled far and wide since then, with development of CT in during 70s, then non-ionizing technologies like ultrasound and MRI gradually taking over. But ionizing radiation is an invisible friend as well as a foe. We don't know what harm it can do, so we at time tend to overuse it. We don't know what harm it's going to bring to the operator, to the patient. So there has to be a course correction as far as advising or suggesting ionizing uh, radiation examinations are concerned. And uh, we are privileged to have amongst us Dr. Roshan Livingstone. He's a professor of radiological physics at Christian Medical College, Vellore. So I've attended his classes during my short tenure at CMC. He was a part of the group associated with the International Atomic Energy Agency, Vienna, to bring about global awareness regarding the harmful effects of ionizing radiation. He's also currently an advisor to Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, Bombay. And his group has established the diagnostic reference levels of doses incurred during CT examinations and interventional radiology examinations. So I invite Dr. Roshan to enlighten us further on this important topic. I'd like to thank the organizers, the director, as well as Dr. Spencer for inviting me for this, uh, uh, delivering a talk on uh, World Radiography Day. The topic uh, is on radiation protection, do's and don'ts. Uh, here you can see how uh, Ronjan, in his early stages, would have discovered uh, its uh, accidental discovery of X-rays. So we have here, it's a Crookes tube, and that would be the first uh, image of Frau Ronjan's hand. We have the wedding ring on this. And uh, this is like a naked X-ray, so you have no protection. And uh, he, he would have seen image something like this. Do we have this? Yes, a lot of hospitals even. Um, have this kind of fluorescent screen of barium procedures and uh, it's slowly uh, been replaced by image identifiers and flash panel detectors. So we just commemorate this day on World Radiography Day. Because of this use of uh, radiation in uh, medicine, various people have to lay their lives because the radiation safety was not so important during those times because they did not know about it. So that's a memorial for radiologists in Hamburg who lost their life due to radiation in medicine, the 4th April 1936. Hence, they started the concept which is called as low as reasonably achievable. So it actually, from 1895 to this time, we don't see anything since 1936. So slowly, radiation safety came into existence. So my topic today was radiation safety, do's and don'ts. I come from Christian Medical College. It's a, a 2,400-bedded hospital. And, uh, uh, about 55 radiation-based uh, machines we have. That's uh, excluding the radiotherapy and nuclear medicine facility. Uh, that's where I work. It's uh, quite um, demanding on uh, radiation safety. We do about 3,000 X-rays per day, so it is we need to have safety measures in that place. This is the earlier uh, experience of history of imaging. You can see here, uh, X-ray tube as such does not have any shielding in this. And there is a man sitting here, and then there's a cassette, the old film screen cassette, and they have to expose, be exposed to X-rays throughout. And here we see a person holding a handheld fluoroscope. 
with a barium flacno cyanide screen, and uh, the X-rays generated from this goes into the the radiologist's eye, and many people developed cataract. So these are the early days. That's the fluoroscopy screen. Should be done in a dark environment. If you clearly see, I took it 10 years ago from one hospital in India, and that's the uh, calcium tungstate screen. And earlier time, how do they have immobilization? So people are holding the child, and then there's X-rays uh, given for a chest X-ray. And these are the latest machines. You do not see any naked X-ray tube. They're all enclosed inside. So here is your X-ray tube. Here's the detector, which is image in its fire. You can see here is the X-ray tube. So standing close to these tubes are very dangerous. You have to have protective measures, because these are very high radiation-based devices these two compared to this. This is the older screen which I was talking about. Some hospitals still may have it. This requires dark adaptation. And this is the uh, conventional machine on copy. So let me outline my talk, which is on introduction, radiation units and quantities, biological effects, dose reduction strategies, some of the do's and don'ts. You see in this uh, United Nations Scientific Committee on Effects of Ionizing Radiation, which is UNSCIA report, has reported like 3.6 billion diagnostic medical examinations are performed annually worldwide. Um, and it's increasing. So we see increase in man-made radiation in uh, radiology, which can be diagnostic as well as intervention, cardiology, gastro, orthopedic surgery, urology, dental, etc. This is how the uh, modalities which dose severity increases. So this is the highest dose generating modality compared to this because this uses lengthy fluoroscopy time. So, so much care is required when working with this machine. It's a very, very high energy uh, imparting machine. And second follows the fluoroscopy. You can have barium, uh, male, barium swallow, those kind of machines. And then the conventional. CT, of course, is a bigger modality, but the occupational workers don't receive much dose as compared to the catheterization labs. So currently what we see in our country is radiation safety is not given high priority as per AERB2. Some occupational workers do not want to wear lead aprons. Sometimes we see in the operation theaters, they may not wear. It's very important and crucial to wear these accessories. Atomic Energy Regulatory Board is now taking steps to optimize doses from CT intervention. So a lot of projects have been initiated to uh, reduce the uh, dose. Currently, they are licensing and registering all the radiation uh, uh, emitting devices. It should be registered with AERB. So, even if there's a refurbished machine, it should be registered under AERB. So, very strict norms are coming by, given by AERB. So, what are we worried about? These are the ionizing radiation. The possibility is this electromagnetic radiation can knock out one electron. So, then there's a removal of electron. That means it is going to be ionized. So that's the reason uh, we should be careful. The properties of X-rays, they can penetrate through the tissues. They can be stopped by metal. Prolonged exposure can create adverse biological effects. So we go more and more on the catheterization labs for a higher time duration. It's easy to see skin erythema, hair loss, etc. This is how X-rays are produced. It's an X-ray tube, which is a rotating anode X-ray tube. This is filament. From filament, electrons are produced and we accelerate the electrons to hit against this rotating anode. Now, this is usually used in catheterization labs, whereas we have something called stationary anode, which is used for mobile machines. So that's the production, something to know about. There's nothing to do with isotopes or uh, any radiation um, continuously emitting from this. But once it is emitted, once it is energized and emitted, it's off. It's, you know, it doesn't emit more unless you give power supply. Some of these radiation units we should know is Ronjin because he discovered whatever energy which is coming out of the X-ray tube, the energy imparted is Ronjin uh, or we can kill milli Ronjin which is a unit of exposure. Then we have absorbed dose, how much our body is absorbed, absorbing this radiation dose which is key for this patient skin doses is given in gray. Effective dose, the collective dose which is from, uh, derived from Hiroshima Nagasaki incidences what would be the uh, occurrence of cancer, stochastic effects, we don't know. So from there we derive it and then get this effective dose. Look into biological effects. There's something called deterministic effect. 
after a certain threshold, after a certain dose from 0 to 2 gray, that is the absorbed dose we saw, these thresholds just increase. The severity of this effect increases linearly. So that's deterministic, okay? And uh, how do we have these effects? We have early transient erythema, it's 2 gray, which we can achieve with typical fluoro, with about 20 milligray per minute. But nowadays, machines are bringing down to 10 milligray per minute. So still, you can go ahead. Maybe two hours or more than two hours of continuous fluoroscopy can create this kind of effect. High dose rate of 10 minutes can see this onset within a few hours. So generally, our fluoroscopy do not go beyond 10 minutes or half an hour in fluoroscopy time. But however, there are procedures where it can lead to about one hour or two hours of fluoroscopy time. So we should be very careful of how we handle these devices. If we are purchasing this kind of machine, adequate safety measures should be taken. And later on, we see several other um, uh, deterministic effects. And this is one of the case study which we see here. This patient underwent coronary angioplasty twice in the same day and under, underwent a bypass graft because of complication. And we see how uh, it is, uh, this is the place where x-rays were generated uh, using the cath lab for facility. Six to eight weeks after multiple coronary angiography. So it was not seen immediately. So this person went to the, uh, the dermatologist, not knowing what it is. So 16 to 21 uh, weeks later, we see this kind of thing, ulceration. 18 to 21, procedures show tissue necrosis. And there's a close-up of this photograph. Finally, they had to do a skin grafting for this. It's all because of radiation injury. Well, so that's happened in this huge machine. What about CT? Of course, if we go on doing a lot of CT procedures at the same location again and again, it's a perfusion CT. We see hair loss, alopecia, which is reported in European radiology, high amount of radiation. And they wanted to do also a DSA procedure on the same region we see hair loss. What about X-ray machine? Of course, this is a report from US. Um, this is a bracket therapy patient who had a prior X-ray exposure. She had three, which was a little bulky. So she had three exposures, uh, which ranges from uh, 10 to 15 gray, which has caused this ulceration of this. So we can see this cross wires, and you go to an X-ray room and see these black wires will be that. So that's the lead uh, markings seen on this patient's skin. What about occupational workers? A lot of occupational workers currently complaining of hair loss, because this one report uh, in Heart Journal so knowledge and optimization is required before we procure these new labs. We should see whether all safety accessories are in place when we get these higher modalities. So we see here chronic occupational dermatitis initially causes skin to become dry, shiny, and hairless. So the dose is like 10 to 12 gray. So if someone is standing there for a longer period of time, when we talk about patient having 10, 15 gray, obviously you're going higher and higher on the patient. It will reflect back on the occupational worker. So it's very important to how we use it because these are under couch x-ray tube. So the couch is down, x-rays can come to our uh, feet, leg, everything. So we should be careful for use. The dose here would be use lead shielding from the couch. What about eye doses? Of course, there are ceiling mounted suspended uh, um, shielding, which is glass shielding with the lead in that. You can use that to avoid cataract. We saw earlier, the earlier days, handheld fluoroscope people were just seeing the images, uh, and uh, uh, they all uh, had cataract. But it happens over a, a few years, not immediately, we'll see. So the International Atomic Energy has reduced the uh, dose limits for eye doses for interventional workers. So we go to stochastic effects. So those are all known effects. We know that it's deterministic effect. It's known. But what about stochastic effects? No one knows. It can happen at low doses. That's why we need to be preventive. We should reduce doses as low as possible. There's no threshold. It's also a linear uh, response from, from zero onwards, you can see. Till this, it's very difficult to extrapolate. So it's all from Hiroshima and Nagasaki data or radiotherapy data we have, saying that if I have this dose, it can have leukemia or something like that. So it's not, uh, we are not so sure about this uh, um, occurrence of stochastic effects. So, but one thing which we can see is this, uh, this is none 
whose profession, whatever she's working as, she's a radiographer. So she's an occupational worker. So whenever children come for x-rays, she used to hold the child, and then x-ray exposure comes towards her. Her hands and her lungs were affected. She had lung cancer, as well as her fingers got affected later, because you saw that x-ray tubes were not shielded. And they had to amputate uh, her fingers and whole hand. Later on, she died. So she was more involved in pediatric cases. That's why immobilization devices had come. You can see this. This child has been immobilized. So instead of rather than holding, so we have more in immobilization devices currently which we can use. And what are we so scared of? These are x-rays that are scattered from the body. So that's why we need proper shielding. So staff are exposed to the scatter. Most of the operator's exposure are from the scattered radiation. We do not have direct exposure because direct exposure of the primary beam is on the patient, whereas the scatter is from the patient. So patient is bulky, that means we are going to get a lot of scatter. So that is one important thing. So what we should know is knowledge about our workplace, where we are working, what is the type of machine. Am I going to work in cath lab, or is it a CT, or uh, is it ordinary x-ray machine, or dental? We should be aware of where we work, what would be the exposure capabilities, how much dose it will produce, what are the various dose reduction strategies I'm planning to implement in this machine, type of personal working, is he qualified to use this machine? Various places in India, when we do a survey on CT scanners, we see about 50% of the people are not qualified. They may be um, just radiographers without proper qualification operating the machine, but it's very dangerous to operate these high-end machines, modalities. So type of personnel, and also pushing the patient, radiation safety accessories, whether they are present or not. These are some of these big machines. And this is one of this positioning the machine, which patient. If the patient's hand is positioned in this X-ray tube area, it's highly possible to get something like this, the skin erythema. And patient-related is body weight. As if the thicker body weight, the more units you're going to give, hence high amount of radiation. Then equipment related would be, what would be the type of filtration, collimation, pulse rays? If you want to me to explain later, I can give a different talk. Operated uh, rel uh, related is beam orientation. How are we going to orient the beam? Is it going to be hitting the staff also? So we need to be careful. We need to train the personnel. Also, if it comes to a pregnant patient, it's always good to uh, cover this area with a lead apron. You can have a, a skirt type apron to cover. So do those are used lead aprons or lead shield on abdominal region. So fetus is very sensitive, and it's actually considered as a public. So it has one millisievert. That's the dose limit which we give for fetus. So it's considered as a public. So we should be aware of fetus is not uh, um, uh, should not get exposed. So whereas the mother needs to be exposed to because of benefits. So we need to take uh, extra care for safeguarding this. So here is a sketch of uh, 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 what you call as a Cath lamp. So here is a patient lying down, X-ray tube, and here the um, image in this fire or the detector. When we see closely, people standing here gets more dose during image acquisition, whereas the radiographer, which is standing far away, gets lesser dose. Obviously, when we have farther away from this, we have less dose. So here we can see 0.04 mR per hour, whereas considering here it's going to be 5 mR per hour, 100 times more on this area we can see here. So that is important to note. So that's why shielding here is important. And the radiation decreases when you go increase in uh, um, distance. So obviously, this the length of the patient maximum only let's consider as 2 meters. And if I go beyond 2 meters, of course, it is reducing here. So the basic principles of radiation safety are time. How long are you going to stay close to the radiation? We have to pay attention to fluoroscopic times when it goes to patient. Five minutes usually is the integrated timer, which will just beep uh, when you in fluoroscopy machine. Then distance, how far are you going to maintain? Distance far away, two meters is good. Maintain minimum, maximum distance between source and patient. So usually non-primary operators, radiographers are part of them, but some are people who want to come and see or they're not uh, skilled professional, they should stand away from the source. Then we have, this is the inverse coil law principle. 
from the X-ray source consider 64 units of intensity. When you move on uh, different distances, one fourth of radiation, it reduces. So if I consider even 100 uh, uh, centimeters, when I have 100 uh, um, MR units of intensity, if I go to uh, two meters distance, it reduces to 25 MR. So that, that's important for us to know, is the increase of distance. So always there's a concern in uh, ICUs and wards when patients are laying the next other beds, what would be the radiation scatter from this mobile machines? So when, they, when the people take this mobile machines, people are really scared, they go and hide behind uh, screens, etc. But uh, it's not necessary because these machines are 60 MA machines, very low end machines. Maybe you can take some chest x-ray out of it because really critically ill patients, but not for all. So all the patients who can walk and go to the x-ray room, it's better to go there. It's, you have better image quality also. So we did a survey about 200 patients in these wards and saw how much would be the scatter. So this, this machine actually, uh, the, the time duration of exposure is only 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 seconds. It's milliseconds. So considering that so low amount of radiation, it's like only 0 0.0013 millisievert per exposure people. So when I consider this, and my uh, limit is one millisievert per year, I will not get so much. So I don't need to be worried about that, but people who are working inside can maintain a distance of two meter, relatively it's zero. Or you can measure it using a survey meter and see, and then so. So that's important when we need to talk about radiation safety. And coming to shielding, it's important. Who was working in a radiation field, um, where they're close to the X-ray tube, uh, if they want to do even CT biopsies when they're close to X-ray tube, they have to wear the shielding accessories. In cath lab, very important is this ceiling-mounted um, lead glass. Then these drapes are very good. We have to use this, reduces to about 75% of radiation dose. And that's important, you can see here. And uh, none of these shieldings, like screen or, or uh, these wooden barriers or curtains are useful. Only this one is good. However, for uh, mobile radiography, maintain distance. Is there something missing in your room? In case you don't see these things, it would be better to implement. Some of other shieldings are movable barrier like this. Some people in cardiology usually they like to have something like this close to it. These are like ceiling mounted and these are lead flaps. Sometimes we also see people inadvertently putting their hand inside while doing these procedures, they're getting affected. We can relate to the uh, story of Sister Blandina who did the same thing after a few years, so you cannot continuously use this one. So there are other uh, shielding devices. You have lead gloves which can be used, and you have uh, uh, eye shields, and sometimes they also have caps, thyroid shields. But if I'm using these kind of uh, safety measures, mostly, we are safe. Other thing is coming to, uh, we have safety, but do we maintain it? So we have uh, uh, lead aprons hanging like this or thrown down. I don't know how many people we all experience this kind of stuff. And people sitting on this <coughs> to view the image. Is this commonly seen? It's not good because this can break. The integrity of the aprons can break. <coughs> it's better to hang these aprons in, uh, so that you have maintained the good condition. What about new aprons? When we buy the new aprons, are they screened? Recently, we did a study on when we purchased a lot of aprons, we want to discard the old aprons and buy. We see here thinning of the apron in this area and how manufacturers have manufactured something different. And here we can see there is a, a stitching error. This is a manufacturing defect. And then they are trying to put some more uh, 0.25 millimeter of lead equivalent material. So these are all new aprons, which is screened and we have to reject it. So not necessarily the new aprons are good and uh, um, are good, have good integrity. We need to test them before we give it out to the people to use. Some are like this. We have holes and uh, cracks which are present. We should always keep on uh, checking the integrity of this apron once in a year or sometimes these things once in six months we do. There is no set limits when we need to uh, discard these, but uh, there are people who have written about this. If the hole exceeds, if this big hole 
aggregate of that, if there are a lot of multiple holes throughout the apron, put the aggregate of that and you see it's beyond 10 centimeters square, then you can discard because these are all lead-based aprons. So pollution control board should uh, come in when uh, we have to dispose these lead uh, uh, based materials. Otherwise, we have these days non lead or lead free aprons. So, do's uh, mild soap detergent is good, do not bleach or use harsh chemicals. You cannot uh, send it for autoclaving and those things. Um, hang the apron to dry, some of these do's and don'ts. Then, coming to personal monitoring, very crucial thermoluminescent dosimeters. This is the badge. Um, people who are constantly using radiation, it's a must, and the AERB's uh, legal norms to use this kind of TLD badge. And they're also dose aware. These are the real-time monitoring doses. The moment you finish a case, you will know how much dose you received. Some of the hospitals have this. And it's quite expensive, but it always keeps in track of how much you received. And some people can use this um, the um, wrist badges or eye badges so that they can know how much radiation dose they can get. These are also available as digital badges. How to use it? TLD badge should be changed once in three months. TLD card should be loaded correctly in the cassette. You cannot turn it and put it because there are certain filters in it. TLD badge should be worn inside the apron, not outside. When you wear it outside, it absorbs a lot of radiation and then gives a wrong uh, value. So do not share the TLD badge. Some people share the TLD badge. You should not do it. It's just personal monitoring device. Do not open the badge or sealed envelope. Once you load it for three months, you're not supposed to open it. Do not use damaged cassette because X-rays can penetrate through cracks. Use the TLD badge of valid service period. Don't keep on using for six or one year. So don't, don't leave the badge in a radiation area or near hot plates. Some people wear it while they take their own x-rays. If they are a, like a patient, it's not allowed. It's an occupational worker dose. Store badge in a dark area with low radiation. So the other don'ts are don't wait till the end of the service period. So these are the permissible limits. For workers, it's 20 millisievert per year. We do not cross such. If we keep on wearing the apron, oh, sorry, the TLD badge, uh, it's good to wear. Lens of the eye, 150, 500 for skin, hands and feet, 500. So obviously now, uh, for a pregnant worker, it's about two millisieverts. It's like coming towards the uh, public uh, dose limits. Some people are seen waiting inside the X-ray CT room. Very dangerous. Please do not advise anyone to stand like this. And if at all required, uh, the helper can wear an apron and stand. The basic principles of radiation safety or protection is justification, optimization, limitation. What we we need to justify every procedure we do. We cannot give a lot of CTs for one patient because we saw the lot of effects which are happening. It can be long-term effect. We don't see it really currently, but there's a long-term long effect is possible. Clinical factors are adequate information we need, clinical information. Whether there's previous records, if we have a PACS, we'll know the previous records. Prior to the investigation of the patient, is there any alternative methods? Or we have to optimize those. That's the next step. Once we justify, we need to see whether we give minimal dose so that you're getting good, accurate quality of image. Attention to be paid for pediatric protocols because they have longer lifespan. So we need to be careful about uh, how they get irradiated. Limitation, there are certain dose constraints. We should be within that limits. Always, it's a practice to balance between image quality and radiation dose, which is called as low as reasonably practicable. So here we see risk versus benefit which comes in. In summary, we can say that there's a need to orient people throughout the country actually on radiation safety, follow good work practice, follow re dose reduction strategies. Periodic quality assurance of these machines are very important, mandatory. Otherwise, these machines themselves can boost up the radiation dose. So when we buy new labs, there should be proper justification. Also, radiation safety culture should be inculcated in this. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you for giving us uh, 
a lot of information about the radiation safety. Uh, I would like to know about any study which says that so and so percentage of people become sterile since they work in no, a. It's no study. We cannot study. give a study on stochastic effects. It's uh, well, a radiation uh, ought to have, as you said, some um, defects on like genetic mutations, uh, skin burns. Yeah. Uh, maybe cancerous, this thing. Uh, there are so many things, but is there really a study which shows that uh, the radi uh, this workers working in this uh, fluoroscopy room, uh, urologist, the cardiac uh, interventionist, is there any study which has really shown that these people uh, uh, have developed leukemia or something? Like yeah, that? there are yeah. studies which uh, uh, there's one Wagner et al. who has written about stochastic effects. Sometimes we do not know what dose they have received because they are not monitored properly because it's occupational. Of course, for, um, for patients, avail it's available. I, I showed some of the information on patients, which are mostly deterministic. So early onset with low doses is not known. There is a debate always on stochastic effects, on cancer risk, whether it's because of radiation or is there some other reason to urge it. So, but if people have developed uh, breast cancer, as well as uh, uh, thyroid cancers because of uh, radiation when they're working for a long time. But we do not know about the dose, how much they received, because they're not monitored. That's the reason we have for cataracts. They, um, there is a group in Spain who is doing a study to see how many interventional radiologists and cardiologists develop cataract. But it also happens over a period of so many years to get this data. Thank you for the talk. Uh, are there other material other than the lead available for the protection? Yeah, there is lead-free aprons, uh, which have the same attenuation. Uh, they are made of uh, bismuth, uh, antimony, and uh, barium. Equally yeah. safe? Equally safe. Available in India? They are available, but I would prefer uh, importing this rather than uh, Indian, because we had few of these uh, models, and uh, it breaks up easily. But... Okay. Uh, the integrity should be always checked every year. So I suggest the importing good ones. And regarding the machines like fluoroscopy and cardiac cath lab, uh, how much is the difference in, uh, in term of the radiation exposure, like uh, US FDA approved or non-FDA approved? It's really a very much big difference or? Cath lab more? on cardiology and uh, radiology? Yeah, and fluoroscopy also. What we use in urology, I'm urologist. So, um, what we see is um, the radiation safety courses should go into cardiologist curriculum also. How it is available in radiology, they learn about radiation safety. When I uh, see in uh, CMC Velo, we had the same problem. Three years ago, we see they don't use this kind of accessories and then uh, uh, there's no standard values. So we, as part of AERB, we did some studies. Uh, and we start to bring down these doses. Suppose we consider PTCA. Some people can finish in 10 minutes, overall fluoroscopy time. And uh, we brought it down to about 50% reduction of dose. So it's possible there. And equally safe, because what happens in, um, um, in uh, cath lab is there are CINE runs, which goes very high dose. Um, generally, what we advise is use of low dose fluoroscopy for Indian population. If the weight of the body goes beyond 80 kilograms, then go for normal. So obviously, in uh, radiology, there will be cerebral embolization or uh, some spinal uh, embolization or something which can go beyond uh, time duration. So, so fluoroscopy as such is a very low-end machine. So the, it is lower than radiography, a single chest X-ray. So, But if you continue exposing to low-dose uh, fluoroscopy for 10 minutes, you will... Uh, get uh, a lot of dose. No, yeah, uh, what I want to ask, manufacturer, those machines which are the US FDA approved and non FDA approved, uh, they uh, emit the X ray and uh, hazardous to the uh, workers. They I, I didn't get your question. Is it uh, FDA approved yeah, for yeah, the machine or? Yeah, machine, machines. Okay. How they are different from the uh, non US FDA approved? Like in commonly we use Ellinger machine in India. Okay, and be careful while using uh, uh, such machines. In India, we have a uh, tabletop dose of 5.7 R per minute. I don't know how it exists, but they have to change something. 
in US FT approved machines, the low dose will be 2.5 R per minute. Yeah, so it's actually low. And uh, when you go for normal, it is 5 R per minute, and high dose is about 10 R per minute. So okay. ARB has to bring those things into it, uh, practice actually. Uh, but uh, most of these machines, since it is like between 5.7, if we go beyond 5.7, AIR will not give the type approval for the machine currently. Thank so you. obviously, AIR plays the role of US FDA here. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your talk. Comment and a query. A query first. Uh, in the OT, when we are using the fluoroscopes, we normally, the people who are not operating or even once in a while who are not wearing the lead aprons, they will generally go and hide behind the another person who is wearing one, hide behind the anesthetist machine if there is a convenient wall or run out of the OT. How safe are these and what distance would be safe for these people? Generally, CM machine, they're all stationary anode X-ray machines. That also has two meter distance you can maintain. But while the X-ray machine is on, the CM is on, it's always better to wear a shielding. Even if it's 0.25 millimeter, it's fine to wear it. And a comment, as you said, safety is least on the priority for all of us. I mean, if I am a neurosurgeon, so I can tell you that we all feel very confident and safe when we even don't wear helmets on the road. So <laughs> from there, what you are saying has to be inculcated. It should start right from the beginning. We all learn about this when it is already too late and we are very, very casual about using these machines. Yeah. There were issues in Delhi where OT staff, they have refused to operate these machines because the court has given them an order saying that people who are not trained should not be forced to use these machines with or without protection. So in Delhi, in our hospital, we had an issue, the OT staff, they put stuck that order on the OT wall and there were no qualified technicians to operate these CIAMs in the OT and it was shut because there was no way of working around this trouble. So whether we should enforce these things before we start using these machines, we always are a little lack. We get these machines and the safety comes last and that two years down the line, maybe few of us would be featuring in our future slides also, the one which you showed. Yeah, yeah I understand. It's a clear picture of uh, Sir was mentioning. Because there is no records of these things, there's one incident, it's a Mayapuri incident. I hope many people know about it. The Cobalt 60 source, someone was putting in the pocket and walking around. And instant death. So it's a silent death. We don't see anything happening. Just because it was shiny, people put it in the pocket. But there are a lot of people who got exposed to it. It's a high-end um, Cobalt 60 source. It's always radio emitting. So when we talk about Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and then extrapolate in here, that is a radiation source which is always emitting. X-rays are not like that. So X-rays, once emitted, if you stop the power supply, it's off. Some people still have the notion that uh, X-rays are emitted from the walls also. So there's nothing happens. It's an electromagnetic radiation. If I switch off the light, it's off. So since it is uh, unseen, and we have not seen such effects which are happening, uh, it is uh, it's a problem that, OK, let's uh, see like going in a, uh, in the road and without wearing an, uh, um, the helmet, what you rightly said, we don't know. It's a chance event. It's probabilistic. So X-rays are like that. I don't know how many people are immune, immune to it or uh, do they see the effect immediately. But seeing this, oh, good old days when we see the memorial for these people who worked with radiation and then they had effects, which is not fully recorded. They were not uh, knowing how to uh, record these things, but few incidences brought about radiation safety. So that's why Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, because of this Mayapur incident, everything, they require more protection. So it's always better. I, I see people, 10th uh, fail people, or sometimes sweepers operating X -ray, CT machines. So uh, I think what the government doing is the uh, right thing, so that everybody should be having enough knowledge uh, in using these big machines. So I would prefer safety first, and then you continue, because it's unseen. We do not know. Something happened, of course. So we had similar incident. There was one uh, orthopedician who was working with radiation and uh, developed some kind of cancer. I'm not mentioning it. Uh, later, having this cancer, they came to know, oh, I'm not wearing shielding. Let's me wear it. So it's too late. 
So it's always better to prevent. I hope that answers the question. I think, uh, <coughs> Roshan, just to add to that, in, in, uh, I think the two main people who uh, have the responsibility of limiting the radiation exposure is the operator, whether it's a radiologist yeah. or a cardiologist, and the person who is operating the machine, the yeah. radiographer of the, of the technology. Now, I'm sorry to say, but the standards of uh, you know, radiography technician in India are not uniform. Yeah. And there are some very, uh, you know, shady institutes which are handing over uh, degrees in uh, medical yeah. imaging without even the candidate attending to that course. So that radiation protection uh, part is equally played by the radiographer. He should be able to say that uh, you use a low pulse rate without him being told collimation, decreasing the uh, repeat exposure, proper positioning. So that also comes. So that's why uh, it's very important to have a trained radiographer operating the machine, yeah. uh, whether in OT or in DSA or in cath lab. One more point to add to it is not all the default setting which the company is giving is optimized. Uh, that is all optimized for the European standards or FDA. Bigger patient, 70 kilogram is the usual uh, reference man, but we do not have so big built patients. So what we do in our places, we reduce it to the Indian populations. Generally, if I see patients who are weighing like 40 kilograms to 50 kilograms, I use the pediatric protocol. It's optimized. So if you do not know about optimization and the radiographers do not know, you can actually tell them to use this and see whether you have a noisy image or not. So that's how we reduce for card cardiology as well as radiology procedures. It's worked well. 40% reduction you can get on doses. If that is reduced for patient, obviously it is reduced for the operator also. Uh, sir, I have a question. Every machine which comes out in the market uh, needs to be registered and get licensed through ARB. Yes. Uh, because many of the I'm from the dental side because many of the dental clinics are not aware about it, whether their machine needs to get. So it's freely available, but they are not registered. Yes. So what is the take of ARB on that? Because they are not, not regulated at all. Yes, the, the problem with this ARB is not many machines are known to them where it is situated. So they are just advertise, advertising everywhere. All the newspapers they advertise. Probably today also there'll be one because of uh, World Radiography Day. Yes, they are bringing awareness. They're asking the companies to bring forward. So when I did the survey with 2006 to 2008, there's 175 CT scanners in Tamil Nadu, unregistered. They don't know. So we give this report to AERB. But if it's possible that in this region, someone goes and does the survey for AERB, it's much value for them. There are a lot of refurbished machines. When they come in, it's like refurbished. So if someone is selling an X-ray unit, Previously, they did, uh, don't need to decommission the machine through AERB. They'll just sell it or put it in scrap. That's the same thing in Mayapuri. It was Cobalt 60 was thrown out, and they took a scrap. So now these things are still happening in India where they take these X-ray tubes and then use it in another machine. So that machine does not have a name. In some places, I've seen dental machines used for test X-ray. It's possible it will come, but the distance is very too much. So dental x-ray has also higher doses if you keep on exposing because 70 kV and about 32 MAS. Uh, it's like skull radiography you can take from that. So obviously there's a scatter. So if you take about 50 x-rays per day, obviously a lot of uh, dentists, I see that two or three exposures a day per person. So if you have 10, obviously you have about uh, 30 x-ray exposures per day. So you need to wear uh, aprons. Many dentists don't wear the aprons, or they're not safe. So the norm is you should have a separate room for a dental machine. And then the barrier is also there. So we have norms from AERB for dental machines. Thank you. Thank you, Roshan. And uh, may I now invite Dr. Kuldeep Singh to kindly give a memento to Roshan.
Thank you all for patient hearing. Thank you.